Today, we're welcoming a woman who's been awarded an MBE, an honorary doctorate, and the freedom of the city of Bristol. All this in recognition of her work with the homeless and women on the street, being the hands and feet of Jesus. Val Jeel, welcome to Preach Magazine. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to, to be with you. And thank you for inviting me to, to do this interview. Oh, it's a pleasure. You're also the author of a book, Broken by Love, which describes 30 years in which you've seen God encountering people with broken lives and bringing healing through your ministry. But let's start from the beginning. There you are, an ordinary, happily married woman in your 50s, leading a very safe, conventional life, and then yes. God stepped in and changed everything. So tell us about how you came to faith in Jesus and how you heard God speaking to you through Isaiah 6. Um. Well, I, I suppose I reached the age of about 40 and I realised that there had to be more to my life than I'd yet discovered. And um, I started going to different churches. I looked at Buddhism. I, I generally looked to see what was, what was on offer. And then I went along one Sunday to the Salvation Army in the inner city um, area of St. Paul's. And I could see that those people there had something that I wanted. And um, four weeks in to going to that, that, meet, that first meeting, I invited Jesus into my life. Wow. And it was the most amazing experience I've ever had. I felt as though the whole room must surely know, must be able to see that something has happened to me. I didn't quite know what. Um, yeah, so that was the beginning. And then six, that, so I was then 44. Mm -hmm. Six years later, um, I'm sitting in the Salvation Army in the evening meeting, and uh, the the captain, uh, Chick Yule, was preaching on Isaiah 6. And um, uh, as you know, Isaiah 6, who will go and who will go for me? And, and in my seat, I said, I will go, send me. I didn't actually know what I was signing up to. <laughs> but yeah, shortly afterwards, God made that very, very apparent. I see. And it was then that you work with homeless people. And yep. Yeah, that's right. Um, I I approached the, the captain in the Salvation Army and said, I feel that God is calling me to leave my safe and reliable job working as a secretary in the university library. It was very safe and reasonably well paid. Um, to go and work in, in St. Paul's with the homeless. And of course, I had no experience at all mm -hmm. um, in this kind of work. Um, and uh, we had a day of prayer and fasting in the fellowship, and it was agreed that, that I would start. And I was then 50 years of age. So it was pretty scary. <laughs> yes. Uh and then after five years of working very successfully with the homeless, you suffered burnout. You sure. took a sabbatical. And you spent I did. time in Chicago and you was, were working there in a home with um, sex workers. That's correct. And in your book, you describe two very powerful encounters with God in Chicago. In one, you actually felt physically lifted up from the floor. And in the second, you were miraculously released from the weight of burnout. Mm -hmm. um, could you describe those encounters? Yes. Well, when I went to Chicago, I was in a very poor state in, in every sense. I was physically, mentally and spiritually exhausted. Mm -hmm. um, where was God in all this suffering that I was seeing every day on the street? Men and women that I'd grown to love were dying. Um, because of their, their circumstances, and my heart was breaking. And it was crazy, really, going to work in, in Chicago when I was in such a, a poor state. 
But I, again, I, I knew that this was where God wanted me to go. And um, after just, well, it was just after a week of actually working in the in Genesis house, um, which was the, the safe house for female sex workers there, um, I was absolutely um, at the end of my rope. I, I was finished. I arrived home at my small apartment that I was renting and um, it was about eight o'clock in the evening and I just knew there was no more of me and I fell to my knees and I, I suppose for the first time in a long time I was able to cry. Mm. I hadn't been able to actually have that release of crying. And I also hadn't been able to pray. And so um, my prayer there on my knees was, God help me. And I just kept repeating it again and again, God help me. I knew that there was no more of me, that um, in my, I'd been going in my own strength and that I needed I needed my God, and God met me there in, in my brokenness when there was no more of me, and I I don't know how long I was there, but it was some time, and I began to feel a bit calmer, and it was then that I felt God's hands on my shoulders picking me up. Wow. It was an incredible experience and I asked for forgiveness and I asked God to take me to a new and a deeper place with him and um, yeah, I had the most amazing sense of, of God's presence. Um, the second experience I had was just a week later some uh, a local pastor and his team of uh, um, leaders were going to Madison in Michigan in in, uh, in sorry in Madison in the United States and I'd been praying with the, with the leader and he'd been helping me and he said to me if things get really difficult for you in Chicago give me a ring and you can come up and join us for, for the weekend. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I was pretty well at the, at the end of, of myself. And I rang, I rang him, his name is Dave Day, I rang him and he said, get yourself a ticket and, and a flight and come on up to, um, Madison. to Madison. And they were having the leadership of Bristol Christian Fellowship were leading a, um, a, a teaching weekend at a Bible camp on a frozen lake. It was amazing. <laughs> it was very, very cold. Yes. And I joined them. I couldn't join in. I was still pretty broken. I, I couldn't join in. I didn't have the confidence and I, I still was keeping myself just man it just getting through really and I went up on the Friday evening and on the Saturday um, I sat right at the back of the hall and observed what was going on and I noticed that there was an, a man also sitting there mm -hmm. who also wasn't joining in and on the Saturday late afternoon this man came over and spoke to me and he said that he'd noticed that I, too, was not part of the teaching group. And could he pray with me? And it was um, a sense of release that I felt when he prayed with me. I can't remember what he prayed. I just remember the experience. Um, and 
I asked him who he was and he said he was a retired surgeon. Mm. And the, the, the strange thing is that when I told the people in the, in the Bible study, um, in, they didn't know about this man at all. They didn't know who a retired surgeon was. So oh. I do. Yes. Wow. So it, it was an extraordinary experience. And I'm very thankful to that retired surgeon. Mm -hmm. And it was actually a beginning of the process of healing. So it didn't all happen at once, but it gave me um, it gave me some an inner sense that yeah, God was with me, and that I could He did ha still have a plan for, for my life, and I should just get on and do it. But yeah. How old were you then? Sorry. How old were you then? I was then fifty-five. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> And so you returned from Chicago and you set up 125, the charity of with caring for which cares for women on the streets in Bristol. That's and correct. you had a drop-in centre at 125 Chelsea Road, which is how the charity got its name. Yes. So could you fill us in on how a drop-in centre works and what you offered the street workers there? Yes. So um, we offered a safe women-only space. And that's really important. So it was a space where the women could come in, they could rest, they could have a shower and wash their clothes. So we had a washing machine and a shower in, in, installed. Um, they, we had boxes around the side, plastic boxes, where they could store their photographs and some of their clothes, because of course, most of them were homeless. And so it was really a safe women-only space. It, importantly, um, I negotiated with the NHS, the Sexual Health Clinic, that they would come along once a week on the Tuesday afternoon, and they would they would um, have a sexual health clinic, so that they could. Um, treat women uh, who had um, sexually tra transmitted infections. Very important. Rather yeah. than having to make appointments in a hospital, which they found impossible to, to attend. Um, so yeah, it, it was a really good place. I suppose the most important thing about it was that it gave us the, um, the staff team and the volunteers, the opportunity to engage with women away from the street, yes. away from their working area, yes. and away from any coercion from, from the pimps and the men controlling them. Yes. Um, it's, it seems like a world, you were introduced into a world in yes. which many people know nothing about. That's correct. And I have a question. When I read your book about, you know, I read that many of the sex workers in Bristol were homeless. Yes. And the question I had was, where do they then conduct business? Um, they conduct business mostly in in uh, the in their customers' cars, or in um, in small areas of parks, um, graveyards. Um, actually anywhere that's just off of the street, but mostly in cars. Okay. It's I, very dangerous. Yes, I can imagine. Yeah, a lot of violence. Yes, and they're very exposed to those. They're, yeah, they're very, they're very vulnerable. Yes. Um, during those years, you've had some amazing answers to prayer. Yes. Could you tell us about the custard van and could you explain how the custard van helped um, sex workers in Bristol? Yes. Well, the custard van was um, a gift um, from a local church uh, and it was an extraordinary gift. God spoke to the pastor there to actually, 
that, that we needed a van and he came and handed over the logbook of, of this um, uh, Ford Transit van. It was absolute, well, it was a godsend. Yes. And it transformed our work. So instead of waiting for the women to come to us, we were then able to go out onto the street. So we would go out each night, each evening, um, between about eight and about one o'clock in the morning. And we would take sandwiches, homemade cake, fruit, um, chalky bars, or women like chocolate, don't we? <laughs> um, and condoms to keep the women safe uh, from uh, sexually transmitted infections and also to protect them against pregnancies that they, they were unable to cope with. Um, and the van transformed the work. Mm. Um, it really did. We were, so instead of just seeing a, maybe a handful of women coming into the drop-in initially, we saw up to, I think the most we saw were 44 women in one evening. So the, the van really transformed the work. Yes. Tell us about why it was called the custard van and tell <laughs> us about how soon after you prayed for a van that God answered that prayer. <laughs> So I prayed for a van early in June, um, it, one evening, and it was exactly a week later after asking God, we had five pounds in the bank. So wow. we had absolutely no chance at all of having a van um, or having anything at all. Um, and it was an absolute, well, and it was, yes, it was a miracle, really, that God touched that that pastor to come and give us the van. The van was yellow, bright yellow, <laughs> and um, it was a large transit van, quite elderly, um, and it was the women who actually called it the custard tart. <laughs> so it was a bit naughty, but the, the, the <laughs> name... The name struck and uh, stuck rather, and it was known as the custard tart. <laughs> <laughs> it's very naughty. <laughs> it is very naughty. <laughs> oh, your book describes several stories uh, where, you know, despite being offered the choice to change their lives, people still made the wrong choices. Some very yeah. sad stories, and they're also stories of transformation. You know, people encountering Jesus and life has been redeemed. Yep. So these women were also offered opportunities to have access to the Bible. So tell us about yes. briefly that story about Tasha in the Bible yes. bookstore. Tell yes. us who Tasha is first and then. So Tasha um, was a very naughty lady. <laughs> <laughs> And um, I had bought I had bought her at least three Bibles, which had all gone missing, and she was always going to um, read them and and do various you know she was always going to spend time with me, but it never happened. And on this particular day, things were really difficult for her. She had four children, and we had all four children in my car with Tasha. Um, we stopped outside of the of Wesley Owen bookshop mm -hmm. in the centre of Bristol on double yellow lines um, because there was nowhere to park. She, as I say, she was very naughty. <laughs> she said to the children, "If a warden comes along, tell them that Mummy's inside the shop buying a Bible." <laughs> <laughs> I mean, oh. anyway, we went into Wesley Owen. And we found a, a very lovely Bible with large print um, for her. And to my huge embarrassment, the, the shop was really busy. She held the Bible up in the air and in a very loud voice, she announced to the entire store, see this, everybody, this is a Bible. And it says in here, 
that the prostitutes are going to heaven before all of you lot. And do you know what? I'm a prostitute. <laughs> I was by this time I was very red. And everybody, the whole place went absolutely silent. And the, the assistant at the till looked like as if, what's going to happen now? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. But there was, you mentioned about people um, making bad choices. And yes, they do. And they did. And they will always, as I have made bad choices in my life. But I recently had a card from, from a lady who'd read my book. Mm -hmm. Her mother had sent her the book. I don't know who her mother is. Um, and she sent me th this beautiful card. Beautiful. And um, she says, thank you for your love, kindness, and non-judgment non of my life, and for loving me in my brokenness. And then she says, I found out I was pregnant with my third child in the toilets of 125, and I gave birth to him while I lived at the well, and reading, and reading your book reminded me of God's hand of protection had always been with me and Jacob. The journey me and him have been on since he was born has been a rocky one. We were apart from for a while, um, as as she, I went back using drugs and working, but I finally found freedom in two thousand and fourteen when I came to Bethel, which is a, a treatment center in Birmingham. After being told I'd never see Jacob again, and he came to live with me in two thousand and nineteen. So she says she found a relationship with Jesus and she's now living in the hope and future that he has promised her. Isn't that lovely? That now, I knew, yeah, but I knew nothing about that because she just disappeared from the street. So we never know oh. how Jesus touches lives and yeah. Yes, eternity will show. Yes. Yes, but you've come to a very important part of your journey when you talked about the well. Yes. So could you fill us in on what you offered people at the well? This was yeah. after your, your leaving uh, 125 charity. That's correct. You left it in very good hands. It's still flourishing today. It is. It is. And... Yeah. And then you moved on to the well. So can you fill us in on that part of your journey? Yes. Um, I realized that the women needed a safe place. We all need uh, we all need a safe place to, to live. And if you're homeless, how can you ever get your head around change, positive change? And so with a Catholic priest, uh, Father Richard Mackay, I set up um, a a Christian safe house for the women who were who were considering change. So it was small, just six bedrooms, mm -hmm. um, a very nice safe home, and it was um, abstinence based, which means there are no drugs, no alcohol, and if people, if women coming into the home used um, drugs or alcohol then they would be asked to leave unless they were absolutely committed to change. Um, and that was a very safe house. And from that, I could see that the, the next step was needed because of women getting pregnant, that we needed a house for mothers and babies. And so we set up Naomi House, mm -hmm. which was for, again, abstinence-based, for, for women to come and they could stay up to 23 months to have their babies and address the issues that had brought them into um, yeah, drug and alcohol abuse and um, street working. I see. And um, could you tell us what happened to the well and Naomi house? 
Well, very sadly, um, the the um, the whole policy around abstinence-based projects was changed. So there's the the policy now is to have people on maintenance, mm -hmm. which is um, methadone and Subutex, um, and which I I totally disagree with mm -hmm. because methadone is an opiate, and it's a mind-altering drug in itself. Why would you want to keep men and women on a mind-altering drug? You want them to be free, to have freedom. Um, and so, yes, the uh, the council closed, you know, took took our funding. Um, very sadly, and for the for Naomi House, instead of twenty three months care, they offered twelve weeks. Oh. which is ridiculous. How yeah. can you possibly have a baby come off drugs, address all the issues that brought you there in the first place, and find a home in 12 weeks? I mean, it's nonsense. Mm -hmm. So I'm afraid the house closed. Oh, that's very It's sad. much needed. Yes, it's very sad. And, and there is more talk in Bristol now about... Um, about opening another well type home for women so after all that you know, these years it's they're thinking about it again hello yes. <laughs> <laughs> so there's hope but working with drug addiction and poverty and so much sorrow took its toll and initially you suffered burnout and after that i did you took steps to ensure when you came back from Chicago, that you wouldn't suffer burnout again. Yeah. So tell us about those steps you took. Well, the first thing I did was to make sure that I had regular supervision and that all employees of 125 and the well and Naomi House, that they all had regular supervision. But with people away from the project, not connected with the project, so they had so that we had absolute freedom to say things as they really were. Yes. Um, and I also had spiritual direction, which I think is really important. Oh, um, with this kind of work, all kinds of issues come up that really challenge you in your faith and your, your morals, um, because, you know, you're wanting, you're wanting things the best for the women when they're in dire situations really and it ch is very challenging yeah. so I needed spiritual direction to make sure that I was going, walking with Jesus not in my own strength and I suppose finally for me it's always been important to, to be in the, in the wild places I like to walk so I like to go to Dartmoor and I like to go to the mountains, in, you know, if I can, in Scotland and Wales. Um, I like, I have to be in the beauty of God's creation and the wildness. And I made sure that I had a bad, I got a balance in my life away from the streets. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. How essential would you think it is for worship leaders, church leaders, ministers who are pouring out to other people yeah. to also have those sort of um, ways of support, sources of support? I think it's very important. And uh, um, I mean, obviously, we, we're, we're all individuals with different needs and it'll be different for every every person. But it's essential to have people you can talk to that in safety, mm -hmm. um, in total confidence, people you can trust, um, good friends, good food. <laughs> um, I I love good food, but also to have to have that time away, to have retreats. I've always had retreats, um, and. Time and in those retreats, time where I can be really honest with God, just to be. Yes. 
um, your story shows that it's never too late to step out. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what would you say to those of us, any one of us who's listening out there and wondering what God is calling us to do? I think he's calling us, each one of us, to listen, to listen to him. Um, I see the Holy Spirit as, as God's activator to change. Um, so when we come in prayer, and if we just come open-hearted and with open hands, and perhaps a willingness to step out, I wouldn't say that I'm in any way, um, I'm not at all brave, um, and I wouldn't say that I was, before I started all this work, I was not at all bold, but I, God has emboldened me and made me more bold to, to have a go. If I think that God is speaking to me, then to, to push doors. Mm. And I found that if it's just been my idea, a good idea, but not God's idea, he closes doors. Mm. So we can go in confidence if we pray and if we try and go um, hand in hand with, with Jesus, not in our own strength, which is what happened to me. You know, I, through exhaustion in, when I was in the candle project initially, I, I lost my way. So hand in hand with Jesus. Yes, that was the Cattle Project, for those readers who haven't read the book, is when you were first working with homeless people. That's in, correct, yeah. The first five yes. years. And I lost my way. Um, but fortunately, God brought you back. So. Yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, how can we effectively share Jesus with a sceptical yet curious world? It must have been very difficult dealing with hardened sex workers, hardened homeless people who've never really felt God's love, mm -hmm. and yet you managed to break down barriers, and many of them came to see God's love and experience it firsthand. And in your experience, what role does the Holy Spirit play in that whole process? Yeah, I think the Holy Spirit has to be, you, we, you have to go hand in hand, yeah. So prayer, obviously, praying constantly and having prayer support. But I think simply by showing the love of Jesus to people who have never experienced love, maybe, they certainly haven't experienced anyone they can trust mm. um, because they all they know, is, many of them, is abuse. And so never promising something you can't deliver um, and trying to be constant and showing the love of Jesus by going the extra mile um, and just being non-judgmental, I think. I think, you know, it's, yeah. I have learned so much from those men and women that I've worked with. Mm they have ministered to me mm. um, and I am so grateful to them. I've learned about, I've learned about, my, about myself mm -hmm. and I've learned about um, the lives of other people and how blessed I am and have been. Um, yeah, I wouldn't have missed a minute of any of this. <laughs> <laughs> It's been an amazing journey. Yes, it certainly sounds like a roller coaster ride. Because oh they... yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, could you finally tell us about how the book came about? Um, yes. Well, I I kind of we got to lockdown. Mm -hmm. um, it was interesting, really. During lockdown, I got diagnosed twice with breast cancer mm. um, first of all in 2020 
and had treatment mm. and then went back for a, a, a checkup the following year and found that I had breast cancer in the other breast, a different cancer. And it really got me to thinking, I thought, I need to write down for my granddaughter so that she knows what grandma's been up to. <laughs> And also, perhaps as an encouragement to other people mm. to have a go. So that was how it came about. So, yeah. Thanks. And I had help from a friend, Peter Hill, who helped me. Mm -hmm. And um, finally, from Jude Simpson, who, who was my co-writer. And Jude, um, she she's a... a she she sort of did her word magic on on the book. Yes, but there's a very authentic voice which comes through, and it really is inspiring and a great legacy, a wonderful legacy of seeing how God can work with whatever we offer Him. So, thank uh, you. Congratulations. And well, thank you very much, Charmaine. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, very inspiring. Um, we're going to end this interview a little bit differently. We usually, usually we ask our interviewees to pray, but today we're going to ask you to read from one of the passages you quote in at the end of this book, um, Isaiah fifty-eight. Um, I think you'll find you found it inspiring in your own life. I did. And yes, my prayer is that. The Holy Spirit will be working as you read these words so that we too will be uplifted and encouraged and inspired to go forth. So Isaiah 58, starting at verse 6. Is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen, to loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke? to set the oppressed free and break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter? When you see the naked, to clothe him and not turn away from your own flesh and blood. Then your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call, and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help, and he will say, Here am I. If you do away with the yoke of oppression, with the pointing finger and malicious talk, and if you spend yourselves on behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness and your night will become like the noonday. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. Your people will rebuild the ancient ruins and will raise up the age-old foundations. You will be called repairer of broken walls, restorer of streets with dwellings. Amen. Amen. That's beautiful. You've God has really used you to be a repairer of broken walls, Bell. So <laughs> we thank him for your work, yes. and we ask him to raise up a hundred Bell deals in our generations. Thank you for your time.